John Keel is a man. Scratch that. He is the man behind tech support with camera bits, the small but mighty company behind Photo Mechanic. If you remember, I actually made a video a little while back of how I have incorporated Photo Mechanic into my workflow, especially when I come back from shoots where I have to go through hundreds of photos quickly. John was very generous with his time today and really embodies what camera bits is all about, in my opinion. Helping photographers. John and I sat down for over an hour, which is insane to think of. Thank you, John, for sharing your time with me. And in that time, he not only showed me a bunch of new tips, tricks, and shortcuts around photo mechanic, he took the time to answer every single one of my questions. So here is John dropping the photo mechanic knowledge bombs and schooling all of us in the art of culling photos quickly and effectively. I feel like photographers get overwhelmed if they shot maybe their first wedding. They're like, oh my God, I have 3,000 photos. What the heck do I do with these now? Yeah, that's it because again, wedding photography in particular, I shot one very small yes. wedding and it was the last one. Uh, it was nerve wracking. <laughs> it was nerve wracking. No. Um, some of these people, and we have ambassadors uh, that use us that shoot massive giant weddings, uh, super big celebrity weddings, super big Indian yeah. weddings that last multiple days, um, have multiple shooters, and they can come back with just thousands upon thousands uh, of images. Raw files get bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, it, phone mechanics still just does what it does. And, you know, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't really change how fast it can uh it can help you, you know, get through get through those. And, and the organizational tools are, are really important in it as well. So if you go in uh, from the contact sheet into the preview window, and if you don't know, you can just press the space bar and jump right into that, um, yep. as well as pressing the magnifying glass. So um, if you go into preferences and you go to the preview window preferences here, gotcha. okay. in the upper right, you can change uh, change it to tell Photo Mechanic to automatically advance to the next photo when you either add a tag, add a color class, or add a star rating. And just as an example, since I know you use star ratings, uh, if you check that and click OK, now if I give this um, a star rating, it's hard to see here. I'll jump to the next one and just yep. automatically jumps to the next photo. Perfect. And you don't have to use the arrow keys unless you happen to want to jump back to check something, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very cool. I actually prefer hitting the arrow keys just as sort of a um, my own personal confirmation that, you know, I'm ready to move on. Um, but if you're going through a For lot sure. of images, just, you know, saving that split second, you know, it's so just another way that adds uh, a little extra time saving as you go through go through your images. For sure. One other thing while we're in the pr uh, preview window is I noticed that you uh, uh, zoomed in and whether you whether or not you, you know, check the box or just press the Z key to zoom in. What I'm going to do is open up here. Actually, we'll open up some Jason's images. Uh, this is a photographer, Portland photographer, who we worked with to get some images. This can be helpful, especially um, if you're taking portraits. Sometimes uh, we'll do do this one yeah. here and jump back over to preview so now this is a, a canon image if you press z it's going to it's going to zoom in now set by default to zoom in right to the middle of the image since you're on a mac if you hold down the command key you can click on the part of the image you want to zoom right into and that way you don't have to scroll very cool it bypasses the z key completely yeah so what it does it just it just lets you set the area you want to zoom into and then you can Very just cool. hit the Z key again to zoom right back out and it will lock it into that position. So the next, if you move to the next image and hit Z, it's still going to jump up to that last portion. You can just command click right into the face, keep it there for whatever set of images, do that again for the next set of images. And that can really come in handy when you're doing a lot of portrait work and the uh, eyes are at the top part of the frame. Another thing to be aware of if you're not is uh, the zoom slider here. I mean, it defaults to 100%, but you know, if you happen to want to zoom in further, uh, like that's at 300%, I'll just change that for now. When you zoom back out, it's a sticky control. It's going to stay at whatever the last setting you used was. So in some cases, it can be handy to make sure you you know click back over to 100% or whatever you happen to do before you pop out. Uh, depending on if you use the histogram um, is kind of, um, I don't ever use it really. But one thing that happens is that if you ever want to check on a raw image, if 
uh, if you've uh, blown out the highlights and they can't be recovered or the uh, one uh, the shadow detail is so dark you can't recover it there are these options down here so if you click lost shadow detail you'll see the blue uh, splotches around where that has gone past where you can recover it in a raw image uh, same way with blown highlights uh, if there were any which there aren't in this you'd see the red splotches uh, just as a yeah. way to quickly identify that these often these also have um, these also have keyboard shortcuts I don't know how much you use keyboard shortcuts all the time <laughs> right these have kind of secret keyboard shortcuts because we get calls from customers that say all of a sudden I'm seeing blue splotches all over my image etc uh, so uh, um, it's B for blown highlights. And again, you can't really see it in this image just because I don't have any. Um, or N, because N is just in the right next to um, the B. That, okay. I, that will turn uh, turn into uh, the shadow detail. So you can turn those on and off by pressing just those keyboard shortcuts. And if you press the same key again, it turns them off. That's actually very helpful, John, because that's very similar to what Lightroom would do too, because you can clip that stuff in Lightroom and it matches exactly uh, as you'd see there. So that's cool. Yeah. So that's a good way to do that um, while you're still in the preview window. If you're debating on giving that rate, you know, that image a rating because you want to cull it, you can just double check it that way. Do you know about our snapshots? Because it's definitely something I have on the list to show you later. I do not. Uh, we're going to cover that in a way that I think might be more relevant overall to, to what you do. Um, but uh, in this case, anytime you see these lightning bolt buttons, those are snapshots and those will let you uh, create different versions of that information that you can uh, call up in uh, just like two clicks without having to okay. um, you know, completely re redo everything manually. And I'll show you a really good use of that that you might be able to use, uh, especially with sports Perfect. photography. And then, of course, <laughs> there's uh, there are also you know, there's keyboard shortcuts if you want to, you know, if you want to see these without all the menus, you know, if you want to do split screen and then compare um, similar okay. images. Um, one thing that exists also, and it was suggested to us by a pro photographer client, a uh, customer of ours years ago, is say you're looking, uh, let me get that over there. Say you're looking at a set of multiple images and, um, say that's the first one you're going to start with and you want to compare similar images to see kind of which one is the best one uh, seeing them against each other. If you press the H key, it'll go into split screen and horizontal format. Um, and as you, the uh, rest of the images are going to start appearing on the right. As you go through, if you come across one that you like better and that becomes now your new primary image you want to compare to, if you press the G key, it pops that one over to the left side and now you can keep comparing against um, the new image that you think is the best. Very and cool. you can just kind of continue to do that until you decide which one you want to ultimately then you know, add your rating to. John, when you're in that compare view then, does it lock? So let's say you wanted to zoom in on details, does that still lock on both of them? So if I wanted to zoom in. Yeah, so again, okay, it does perfect. it do it say, yeah. And you yeah. can also, if you if you see in the um, uh, in the window a lock scrolling, that will then let you scroll both images the, in you know at the Perfect. same time. So if you need to do that, uh, go around. And again, Very a lot cool. of these, when you hover over these, you'll see keyboard shortcuts in parentheses, just so you can get to use those because those can save you a lot of time. One other thing that doesn't really come up as often, but just to show it to you, if you're ever in your contact sheet. Um, and you want to check uh, critical focus on an image, uh, you can change the cursor mode from um, regular cursor mode to loop mode, uh, that magnifying class. And you can do that by pressing the Z key, and you'll see it changes there. And then you can click on an image in the contact sheet, and it will zoom in to okay. 100% wherever it is. Sometimes it's the first time you do it, um, there, there can be a lag, but depending on where the image is like that, uh, in the contact sheet, it, it'll utilize another section of the contact sheet to let you zoom in and scroll around. And then you just press Z key again to go back to regular cursor. So as you press Z key, it changes from loop to regular cursor mode. And that can just be another way if you, for some reason, want to keep everything up so you can kind of see where you are relative to 
you know, all the photos you can just change, sure. press Z, click on the, uh, click on the image and drag around. That dog's name is Bucky. By the way, that is uh, Jason, <laughs> the photographer's dog. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and uh, he always, every shoot he does just about, if he can, he gets Bucky in there. <laughs> that's a, that's a feature a lot of people don't know about. Um, or maybe yeah. they see the icons and they just don't think about it. Uh, so much, but that's just something else I wanted to show you there. Okay. So one thing that you did that I wanted to ask you about specifically. So you went through, you opened up a folder of images that you had on a hard drive and you're going through right. and you're making your selections. Once you made your selections, you hid the ones that you didn't select. And then you use the ingest tool to move them to another folder. Yeah. So I only did that for the purpose of the video because that shoot had happened a few days earlier and I knew I wasn't going to shoot the video until so what I typically do when I get back from a shoot is I offload that card right away so how I would have typically done that I would have done that directly from the card is how I, how I had been doing it now I don't know if that's right or not but I would I would read from the card I'd pull that into camera bits make my selections and then only ingest the selects if you will onto my catalog drive if, if that makes sense Okay. Yeah. So there, there are no rights or wrongs when you, you know, kind of comes to, comes, sure. comes to this, but in terms of a typical workflow using photo mechanic, a lot of photographers will do is when they come in from a shoot, they actually, the purpose of ingest is to uh, copy the photos off of your card and onto your hard drive. Um, so it essentially is doing the exact same thing you're doing that, uh, or that you did in your sure. video, but it's, um, instead of, um, um, it lets you just move them onto your hard drive using the ingest tool first off your card. And in the process of doing that, you can add your metadata while they're being ingested. You can ingest to a second backup drive. If you have one all at the same time, <laughs> you can rename them, uh, et cetera. And then as they're if you're going to go ahead and call right away, then they'll immediately just start showing up in a contact sheet as soon as they hit your hard drive. And you can start calling while the ingest is still in progress. You don't have to wait. Gotcha. Okay. So typically that's a lot of the settings that you used and everything are basically the same. It's just that I just um, uh, it's just you do this first using ingest to get them on your hard drive and then call gotcha. from there adding all the metadata and all of this can be done, you know, after the fact as well, obviously. I mean, that's just the primary use of ingest as opposed to what you did, which you could also do um, by using the copy move tool. Um, I just use command gotcha. Y to open that up. And that allows you still, if you haven't added metadata yet, you can still apply metadata and open the template. If you want to physically move the photos instead of making copies, you would check this button. Uh, if you're trying to move them from the folder where you put them on uh, into another folder and you don't want to copy, you wanted to physically move them, you just check that box there. You can still... Um, rename the photos if you want to, you know, and then you choose the destination. So if, you know, if they're in like a working folder, maybe, or a two call folder, folder, depending on what your setup is, then you can still uh, choose the destination. You can create a subfolder inside the existing folder. You can determine a folder this way. I tend to pick, always pick destination. And that way, when I click the move button, uh, once you change, check that box, it changes from copy options and copy to move options and move. If you choose always pick destination, then as soon as you click move, uh, it's gonna open up a finder window and it's gonna let you create the folder you know, where you want those photos to go. And then if you want to immediately uh, start working on those photos, or if you just want a visual confirmation that they're being moved, if you check that, it will open a new contact sheet with a new destination as soon as the images start. Uh, landing in that destination. So that's just sort of a different, uh, like I said, there's no right or wrong. That's just uh, yeah. a way to show you that the ingest typically is used for ingesting off the card, copying them off the card into onto your hard drive, wherever you want them, um, versus the copy move tool to, to move or copy things around that you've already put on a hard drive. Gotcha. So that's, that's an interesting insight, actually, because the process that you're telling me about, basically you're ingesting the whole card onto that hard drive. Right. Correct? Right. Yeah, so then that's why I was using 
my method of madness was to call while it's on the card because instead of taking 2,000 images over to my hard drive, I only want to take the 300 or whatever it turned out to be. Yeah, and so that's that, and that's a very, very uh, standard reason why uh, people will do a similar workflow to uh, what you just described. The reasoning that we have and the workaround behind how to still only end up with the ones you want. Um, the reasoning number one is that they just want to make sure we just want to make sure your images get onto your drive and they get on safely, and you can use the advantage sure. of. Um, adding metadata during ingest, um, copying the images, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, having a backup drive, it, depending on the type of photography you do, sometimes can be really important just because if you go ahead and ingest everything onto both drives, uh, you can Good always point. then call your main drive and still have all the backups uh, on your original drive if you happen to need them for some reason. Example that we've heard is a wedding photographer who's gone through and called their wedding photos and they got rid of one that was just a little bit blurry and deleted it. And then the bride goes, well, that's the only photo we took with my aunt. And, yeah. you know, and they don't care if it's a little blurry, but now the photographer's right. already deleted it off their main drive, but they still have that backup that they didn't call. Um, so that's just, a, and it's always, it's also just a safety measure just in case something yeah. does happen to, to your main drive. You bring up a good point though, and one that I've harped on and I'm eating my own words now because typically I, this is the process I use, but it, it's going to make me rethink because even though I do back up, like that's kind of second step on my list here, what you guys are doing here is you do it all at once and then you're just saying, hey, you can still, if you want, <laughs> you can still get rid of them in that one drive, but then you always have that backup. So that's actually a really good point. I think I should point that out to everyone. Yeah. So, and so like, you know, if I was to go through, um, let me actually do it in the preview window since I have it set up. Um, if I was going to go through and just rate these images and I'm just going to, you know, rate different images, different star ratings and say I've finished my call and I come back out here to my contact sheet and I can see all the ones that I wanted to keep and they have, you know, a single star rating or whatever it is. You know, if you just go through and use like your widget, like if I click on the zero here, it's going to hide everything that doesn't have a star rating. And so everything you didn't touch. Yeah. So if I option click on the zero, it's going to hide uh, everything except what doesn't have a rating. It's only going to show the images that don't have any star rating. And then you can do a command A. Um, and you can then just delete those if you want to. And that way, once you get done deleting all those images, then what you're left with are only the ones that you added a star rating. So with the widgets, I can't, and just in case you don't know, if, if you click on a single rating, then it, then it's going to hide. It's kind of counterintuitive, counterintuitive. And then yeah. it shows you, even though when you hover, like if I was to click on three, it's going to hide everything that has a three star rating. Yep. But if you option click, then it hides everything but except yeah, yeah. i found that out uh the first time because i had gone through and rated everything and I, I clicked on i want all my one star ratings and everything i'm like these aren't the ones i wanted so i had to quickly google i'm like okay now it makes sense yeah so that's so that's a way that's a way where going back to what you talk about about not wanting to fill up your drive with the images you don't want you can still ingest them all onto your uh hard drive add your star ratings, and then just hide those, select all the ones you didn't rate, and then just delete them all as a bulk action. And they're just gone off your hard drive and you free up the space. That covers that. Now, the one thing I did want to show you, you get the big, long, standard default template, which has all the fields. I'm just going to clear that out. Uh, so one thing is that if you don't need all these fields, they just clutter things up, et cetera, et cetera. You can change it. Um, by going, you can uh, turn fields on and off. You can rearrange them however you want by going into the preferences to accessibility and the metadata template button here will let you bring up this panel. You've got the left side at the top, right side at the bottom. You can just turn fields on and off that you don't want, that you don't use. And if you wanted to completely rearrange them on different sides, uh, different sides of the template, et cetera, you can always just click and drag. And that way you can completely customize the template so it makes sense to you. Then when you're done and you want to hang on to that, 
you can click the snapshot button, click save, and you can call it my template, whatever you happen to want to call it. You can decide if you want to spell it properly and click that. And so right now, uh, I, I didn't really change anything, but if you ever had it in the default, yeah, so you just click that, then you can click into that snapshot button, find my template, click it, and it goes back to um, the way you ha had it set up. Sorry to interrupt. That's just going to save the fields and everything. But then when you get into apply metadata, that would be where you would save things that are filled out, correct? Correct. Like your name and, uh, okay. Yeah. So, and you can see too here, if you ever, and the metadata info window, which is the one that uh, you get to through the preview window that shows the um, um, image on the left and the template on the right, uh, that just shows you any metadata already existing on that image in case you want to add some additional um, information. What a lot of sports photographers will do is when they first ingest their images, they might put, you know, the copyright contact info, the name of the location, the support, you know, the keywords with the team name, et cetera, et cetera. But then when they go through the method of culling, they can use the um, window, uh, the IPTC info window to then, yep. You know, maybe at that point they want to add the uh, player's name uh, or add an additional piece of information or add a, you know, a headline or a description about what's going on on that particular image. And then you can use keyboard shortcuts or click through to move to the next image and do the same thing. Very if cool. you use code replacements, do you use code replacements? I don't, but I I have seen that and that is mind blowing to me. It's it. I mean, that's a that's got to be a huge time saver. Yeah, what a lot of big sports photographers will do is that because they'll get the team rosters ahead of time, they can create their code replacement file. And a lot of times it's just the jersey numbers. Um, yeah. And they'll type that in. So uh, and later they can just type in that uh, jersey number with the delimiter characters before and after it. And it'll just automatically put the team, you know, the member team member's name on it, or you can set it up with multiple variations. So you can add just their name. You can add their name and position. You can add their name and a description. Um, code replacement is a super time saver as long as you have time to set it up in advance, just yeah. saves you from having to type that name a hundred times or 50 times or whatever it is. You can type it once, load it up, then you just type in the Jersey number and it, adds it all for you right there. For but sure. what I wanted to show you about the main template <clears throat> is that say if it matters and you need to keep track of different locations where you shoot, like a lot of sports photographers will shoot in a couple of different arenas or stadiums or that kind of thing. Um, you can create different snapshots for each arena that already has all that information filled in. Um, what I like to do is like I have... Um, I have a snapshot already set up with my information here uh, so that when I ingest, I start with this. I just always have that as the main thing that I use. So it automatically goes on every image as soon as, you know, they're ingested. But you can start with that. And then if I wanted to create a new one and um, at a new uh, location, so say it was because I'm in Los Angeles, so. LA yep. Dodgers game, and then you know I could put LA and location Dodgers Stadium, etc. Whatever other information you think you might need, it already has this information in it here. So I could just go in here, I could save it, and I could just call it Dodgers. And then the next time I needed it, no matter what was in it, I could click clear just to clear out any information that I might have used before, go down here, click Dodgers, and now my copyright info, Dodger Stadium info is already there. I don't have to just type it in every time I go to that location. Quick question on that. Yeah. So I see you using that snapshot lightning bolt down there. What is the difference between that and that save button that is right in the middle of the screen down there? You got clear load, save, or does it serve the same purpose? They serve the same purpose. The only difference is the snapshot. Ah. Is they go to a complete, you can create a folder. I see what you're saying. And we, we suggest people, you know, create a documents folder called Photo Mechanic. Like in mine, I have a code replacement folder. I have an IPTC template folder. So I can just save different documents that I might gotcha. use in different folders. The lightning bolt is just because you can go click, click. Yeah, yeah. And it's so lightning, that other lightning fast. 
yeah, so that other save button would be maybe if I needed to share it with a fellow photographer that was maybe yeah. that I needed to share the template with. Okay. Yeah, you could absolutely save it, send it to somebody else, and they could load it up. Then they would click the load button, load up that file, and then have all the exact same information. Right. Yeah. And then in this case, uh, you know, with our variables, also, like, you know, if I have year four in here, then I always know it's going to pull whatever, you know, year already set by the camera. You know, you can use that, that same thing, like when you're creating, uh, when you're ingesting, uh, for example, what some people will do is they'll do into dated folder with name um, or sometimes just into dated folder and they'll use, uh, um, whoops, I'm sorry, into folder with name. And then that way they could, you know, put like, use date sort dash just because that puts a hyphen in between each of the uh, things. And then they, from there, they might create, use the slash to create a new folder and then, sure. uh, you know, type in the name of the folder. And then as long as like in my primary destination, if I have it set up, I don't have a 2023 folder yet, I don't think, but you know, I might have it set up. You know, that's my root folder. I just have to change it at the beginning of each month. And then I can just create subfolders um, this way using different combinations of variables and, whatever else I might need. If you rename your photos uh, at all, um, one thing that I used to have, and let me see if it's still in there. I just got to scroll down. Yeah, so I kind of learned, I, I, I learned this from um, Bob, our tech support manager who's been with the company forever. Uh, I'll add this to every image. Um, and by putting this file name uh, variable in here, uh, if I rename the image, then it keeps the original file name in it. If in case I needed to go back to maybe my backup where I didn't rename the image. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just something I learned in terms of, I just put this information on everything I ingest. Um, and with the file uh, variable there um, in the event, you maybe you don't rename them during ingest because that would rename them on, on both drives. Uh, but yeah. even, even if you did that, then it should still keep the original file name. Could you go back into the preview window too? I had a question earlier, and I didn't know if you'd get to it. Absolutely. Because um, it looked like, and I haven't done this, but I had two questions. With the, I think there's a crop tool. So it seemed like there is a snapshot with that. And then my second question was going to be, that's not going to delete the pixels, but so like, let's say we crop it in here. If I were to then inject or import that into Lightroom, would I still be able to recrop it later? Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, you can definitely go in and if you want to create snapshots of specific formats, yeah. that kind of thing, because the um, settings does come with the ability to create a constrained crop and you can just put 10 by eight, eight by 10, whatever you happen to want there and then save that as a snapshot uh, there as well. And then if we were to crop Let's just say, okay, so I've got to set by four by four. So just do a square. So if I wanted to do a, oh, hang on, clear that. Oh, that's because I didn't check it. So if we want to create a square crop, square crop there, um, then I, you can always press P to preview it pop back out. Then when you take it over to Lightroom, it's going to apply the crop. Uh, right. But there's the button in Lightroom where you can then just see the full image and then you can go in and Perfect. change things. This just adds this this crop information to the metadata so that when it Very goes cool. over to the editing program, it'll all, already be cropped for you. As a Mac user, you do have uh, a, a hack that you might not ever really need, but Windows users don't have it. Uh, if you want to get hide the uh, left-hand panels, uh, just to see the whole contact sheet. If you go up here and double-click in this blank gray area, mm -hmm. it'll just it'll just collapse those left-hand panels to give you the full full screen. One other thing I was going to show you, just in case uh, you don't know it, and it happened when I first opened this, uh, you know, you can add up to if you go to the contact sheet page, you can add up to three more labels underneath the file name in the oh, thumbnails okay. okay, and by using the variables in each of the file names. And this one, I just added a blank space in, in line one and um, use the variable for folder. So it shows me what folder it's in. 
Uh, so if you open up a, a, a parent folder with maybe five other folders inside of it, all in one big contact sheet, um, this is a way, you know, you could just, while you're looking at the uh, contact sheet, you can see which of the subfolders it's in if you needed to, but you have the full, you know, the full range of all the variables where you could, you know, display the lens you shot it with, you could you know, display the date and time, the keywords, et cetera. Um, by using this file name plus three labels option. On that note, let's say you wanted like the date that it was shot or the time that it was shot. Would that be able to be filtered? I think by default, obviously it's filtered by date, right? But let's say I wanted to filter it by everything that was shot on 85 millimeters or something like that. Yeah, actually that's funny because that's literally what I was just gonna show you is that, so right here in the sort by filter, yeah, the default setting is to filter by file name because that's the fastest way for it to uh, photo mechanic to sort images because it just has to grab the file name. It doesn't have to dig into a specific piece of uh, metadata or exit data to, to find the information to filter it. So you've got all these other options here. Uh, you can sort by capture time. You can sort like if you use color classes or ratings, you can sort it. So all your five images, five rate, star rated images are at the top. Wait, actually, is that right? Does it start with five? Yeah, it starts with five stars and goes down from there. Uh, you can create an arrangement if you want to uh, rearrange the photos the way they are in the uh, contact sheet. You can go up here to view, make arrangement to get started. And then you could click on um, the, the best way to do it is click on the image once and then just click again and hold and drag. And you're supposed to get a, there it is, um, a line and say, whoops. So if you click and hold to drag the very first time, a lot of times it selects instead of drags. So if you click once and let go and then click and drag right again, you can do that. And what happens then is if you go back to the default setting to file name, if you ever want to go back to the arrangement you just made, you come down here to click arrangement and it jumps back to the arrangement. But these 10 numbered filters are all customizable. Okay. Because you can see the variable uh, for each yeah. one. So if you wanted to uh, sort by lens, like, you know, you could click on that. And again, if we were to go to the contact sheet and if I use the um, lens variable now you can see like these are all shot on 35 and as we scroll yeah. well, well I know he's I know he zoomed in at some point or at least I thought he, yeah I thought he did but yeah so you can see uh, the lens that you shot if you ever want to create your own spec a uh, specific one that's not uh, that doesn't come uh, by default, you go to edit custom, you go up here and decide which one you want to edit. Uh, I'm going to yeah, use this one, uh, has crop. Um, actually, I'll go by firmware. And then what you would do is you would just change the variable uh, here and here. There's also a secondary variable you can use. Uh, I don't think I've ever used that. Um, but um and then once you have it changed and click OK, then that will now be that new numbered option uh, that you can gotcha. use anytime you want to. What are your competitors like? Like Adobe's got Bridge, but as far as I can tell, I didn't think it was as robust. Uh, and as I don't think there's any other competitors, but do you have any insight? Because obviously you're more closely attached to this than I am. And how do you guys stand out compared to the competition? Up until recently, I can't say that there aren't newer programs out there that are trying to compete with us. And I I know there's one, and I can't think of the name of it now, which just specifically calls us out and says, hey, use us because now we're faster than photo mechanic. Because we don't focus on pixel editing, we do kind of one thing and we've done it. Like I said, we've been around for 25 years because most other raw viewing programs are raw renderers. So I have to take that extra time to render out the raw image. And I you know, imagine they've gotten faster, but it still is as files get bigger, um, you know, there can be a, a time frame there. And if you're a photographer that shoots hundreds or thousands of images, you know, on a job that those seconds add up. We get a lot of questions on a, a fairly regular basis about, you know, when are you guys adding AI? Um, you know, when are you going to add this? When are you going to do this? And uh, with AI, um, I know our philosophy is, you know, we don't want a... a 
uh, an algorithm to determine your best photos. You're the best person to determine your best photos. Um, sure. We don't want to get into a position where we're, we believe in preserving all the data in your images. That's why we don't do anything that, you know, uh, changes your raw image in any way. Outside of the fact of, you kind of no longer have to shoot raw plus JPEG, because if you shoot only raw, then you can always just come up to tools and, and uh, you know, extract the JPEG preview. And then automatically you get the JPEG image. Wow. Um, for that. So it's a good way for after you've done your selects, you know, if you want to fire off a few JPEGs, you know, to a customer. And again, I always use wedding photography in some examples because yeah. sometimes they're a little more applicable to some of these options than sports photography is. But, you know, a wedding photographer might go through and, you know, they might, as in addition to a color or star rating, they might hit the T key to tag images, you know, that they want to get to the bride because I always say the bride, because the groom doesn't usually care, um, and um, get to the bride real quick or the couple real quick, and then they can select just their tagged images and select them all, and then just pull a JPEG preview out. Uh, use Command-J to split out the images so they're side by side. Go up and filter uh, sort by type, and it'll sort by the first letter in the uh, file name. So in this case, it's just one JPEG. And then you can select just the JPEGs and, and fire those off to the uh, to the couple. Oh, well, from what I can tell, like I said, I, I kind of did some quick preliminary research and I used it for that first free month. And I'm like, I gotta, it's just such a time saver. Uh, I've tried it with Bridge a little bit and I tried it with Lightroom because even Lightroom had just came out where they're like, oh yeah, we're using the JPEG previews and but it, it still was it was not as fast and not as robust as far as I could tell there's a lot that you can do uh, with photo mechanic and as you know I'm not even using it <laughs> till its fullest potential I'm just using it basically to call and get onto my hard drive uh, yeah for the most part yeah and and that's the nice thing about photo mechanic I mean it's the same way with any program I mean I've been using Photoshop for 20 years and I probably touch a tenth of that program at best right. um, but with this program again um, you know, you can use it for its basic culling properties and tools like you do. And that's that's worth the money um, because of the time it saves you. But if you get to a situation where you want to dive deeper, you know, there are deeper, deeper things to do. I don't think it happens often, but I know there have been times in the past and we're a small company. There's only about 12 of us, maybe. Um, and only a few, few people that write the code. And uh, I know in the past, a photographer, you know, that we know will say, well, I wish it did this. And Dennis in particular, the owner will go, oh, hang on. And, you know, like in a couple of hours, he'll write the code and throw it into the program. I go, okay, it does that now. <laughs> and with sports photography in general, in, in, in a lot of cases, like I said, we've been around 25 years. A lot of people have been using us for a lot of those years. Uh, and it's just, it's, you know, it's like they're, you know, their left arm, you know, they, even if a program might do something the same or better, they just, you don't want to have to learn a new software, you know, and you know, this does what it does and you know that you can get in touch with us and you're talking to people and they can, you know, they can help out or, or, or find out solutions for you. And uh, customer service has always been a, a big priority and we only charge, you know, it's not a monthly subscription. It's a one-time fee, but you know, we're always yeah. available on the phone or by email to, to, to work with uh, customers one-on-one -on -one as much as uh, we need to. I think that's a good point too, because we're in a day and age now where everything is subscription-based. Uh, most photographers that I know, not that they're trying to cut corners, but sometimes subscriptions obviously add up over time. Oh yeah. So tying, it, tying in with that, you kind of touched on it too. You talked a little bit about, about AI and I agree. I don't think that's necessarily your, your target market here, but are there any things on the horizon that you can talk about? Because I don't know, but is there anything in the horizon that you kind of see as improvements or where you would go yeah uh, you know to, and again to be completely honest i don't know because i don't actually know what they're working on most of the time gotcha um okay. you know those discussions happen in a whole other you know slack channel and a whole other conference call sure. that kind of thing i am not involved in that <laughs> to like keep keep john out of it <laughs> yeah uh because sometimes you know i know for a long time people i forget what it was or there, there was something that people kept asking for and it just took a long time to to implement and to test and and you know you've got windows versus mac and sometimes there are yeah. different roadblocks you know involved in the different uh, operating systems 
Uh, I know a lot of people have been asking and continue to ask for an iPad version uh, of Photo Mechanic. And apparently there's just something involved in that that's really hard. What's the best way? Obviously, you guys have a website, but is there a better way, better avenue to get in contact if you're just interested? I know it's actually the website's easy enough. If you want a free trial, you can just go get one. Uh, but what would be the best way if they have questions? Yeah, so uh, I mean, if you want to jump in uh, with the free trial, obviously you can go right to the website, start one of those 30 days, no credit card, uh, et cetera. Um, And other ways is just uh, email or phone, you know, just call us or send us an email. You know, I have questions, Uh, you know, can you help me with this? I'll do these kind of one-on-one sessions all the time with customers who you know have a problem, and we'll log cool. on to we'll log on to their computer, mm-hmm. and they can show us where the problem is, or how do I do this, or how do I do that, and we can just show them right you know on their computer and set things up. Twice a month, uh, we have a photo mechanic one-on-one live webinar where typically Mick uh, from our marketing department, um, but I think I'm going to start doing those uh, soon. Uh, we'll just go over the basics. Uh, a lot of what I've showed you here and and uh, just, you know, here, this is what this is and this is how you do this and how you do that. And it has a live chat window. Um, you can ask questions that we'll try to answer right away. And then on our website, we have a knowledge base and people can click into that and read articles and see videos that usually connect to things on our YouTube channel. But, uh, you know, like I said, because of our customer support, we're happy to talk to people and work with people one on one on answering questions and that kind of thing. Yeah. The final thing I would say on it is just how it integrates into a workflow because you could be in an existing Lightroom and there's other ones too. I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but like anything that you're using for the editing, this they work hand in hand. I have no problem having a separate program that's going to help me call and organize and everything and then do my edits on something else. So uh, yeah, I think it's a great product. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks so much. Yeah. That's the thing is that uh, I feel like Lightroom and Capture One are the are the, the two big ones yes. followed by like Photoshop <laughs> slash Camera Raw. Uh, but uh, we hear from Capture One and, and Lightroom users all the time. And yeah, it's the first step because, you know, you can just get to those images that you want to edit and then get them over into that program and just keep going. But this, you know, can like I said, let you get the metadata in there, um, get all that information ready to go. And and uh, uh, because it can do so many things as bulk actions, uh, you know, you can do big yeah. chunks of, of uh, work really quickly. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I also appreciate you reaching out. I had no idea, but I've learned a lot and I'm going to share it with uh, the people that watch my stuff. Yeah. Thank you for, for helping out. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. Yeah, you too. Take care. With photography, you have to enjoy the whole process, from the shoot to the culling of the images to editing the images to delivering them to your client. The problem with most photographers, especially those that are just starting out, is they don't know the workflow and they don't know where to begin. But you're in luck and you're in the right place. If you want to join the community here we're building on YouTube, then go ahead and subscribe down below. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feedback, or corrections, leave them in the comments. I do read them all. Peace out, and until next time, I'll see you guys later.